Yeah. Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode four. And this is Lisa DeBates. How you doing, Hi. Lisa? I'm good. I'm good. Right. Can you still hear my background noise? No, not not too bad. Yay. Yay. Yeah, you guys, there's always like a little bit of tech uh, involved here, but we welcome you to our uh, live session. Um, and please use that chat to let us know like where you live and uh, let's see here if I can find the chat. There we go. Hi, Marit. Yeah, oh, we've got Marit here. Awesome. Hi, Marit, all the way from Norway. Yeah, <laughs> yeah if anyone uh, comes on and would like to share uh, what location of the world they're they're popping in from, and um, we just love to, to know uh, if you're there. Hi, Carol. And uh, maybe you're, hi, Robert, your favorite medium to work in. I know a lot of you are multimedia people. Um, perhaps you have a favorite. Uh, you know, personally, I work in four mediums. And Lisa, what mediums do you work in? I work in watercolor, acrylic, and encaustic now. All right. She's just added encaustic to her arsenal. <laughs> yes. Hi, Bonnie. Hi, Rajmi. Awesome, guys. Thank you for joining us. Um, Burkana, what a beautiful name from Tucson, Arizona. Helena Messier from Montreal. All right, I'm probably like ruining your names, but <laughs> I apologize. Charla, Becky. Hey, guys, we're going to give you just a few seconds to, to you know, uh, come on board here. I know this is a new time, and I had a visitor uh, gallery come to my studio this morning, and they they took quite a few paintings away, so that was always nice because now I have more room to make more. <laughs> and you guys, Lisa's coming to my studio at the end of the week, right, Lisa? Yay! Yes, I can't we're wait. Gonna have, yep, we're going to be doing lots of encaustic, and we'll do a live on Monday. We can, we don't even know what we're going to do, right, Lisa? <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> I'm, we I'm not just packed. Right. Yes. Well, that's okay. No, we don't pack till the night before, right? That's right. Um, that's right. Last minute. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Neves and Liz, Susan Warlow. Great to have you, Gail. All right. Awesome, guys. Love seeing you. So um, today is a, a interesting day. Uh, I, I should uh, uh, flash back to last Monday. So in episode three, uh, Toward the end of that session, I, I was starting to show you an acrylic piece that had some collage on it. And uh, I didn't get very far because I think I spent more time on the cold wax and oil. And so that session ended, but I had a whole palette full of like wet paint. And I thought, okay, I'm going to keep working on it. So what I did was I did uh, continue on that piece to the point where I thought it was done. And I even had it in a frame and, you know, I looked at it for a while and, uh, few days passed and I thought, you know, it's good, but I think I can do more. So how many of you have had that point where you, you know, you kind of felt good about a painting, but I want to say the word good because good is good, <laughs> but sometimes we feel like we can do better. And although this, uh, today's episode is kind of like, don't settle for good when you can have great, I would say don't settle for good when you can have better. And better is kind of like a step-by-step um, -step thing we build from, first we have to have good. And then uh, deep inside, if we let a few days pass, or Lisa's really good at this now. She's, she's become an expert at letting her, her work speak to her. Right, Lisa? That's right. Yes. And what happens is when you give your work time and yourself time to think about where you're at with your piece and, it, and you know, like the first day you're like, wow, I, I'm so happy. I, I think it's done. And then how many of you come back the next day and it's like, well, but I don't feel as good today as I did yesterday. Uh, and, and so we tend to pop it into a frame and we, we try to love it. But, you know, if we're being honest with ourselves, which is what happened to me, I decided that. I wanted to, uh, I, could, I could do better. So better is the word for me for today. I wanted to do better. So today's demo, and I've got, uh, I, I recorded five hours. And don't worry, I'm not going to give you all five hours, but uh, I do tend to document what I do. And then I uh, condensed all of that content of five hours down into um, smaller portions for the acrylic and smaller portions for what I did I moved this painting into oil and cold wax. So I know that a lot of artists are um, 
either interested in oil and cold wax, they work in oil and cold wax, or they're new to it, um, or they're, they're not sure if they like it, all of those things are fine. Uh, I want to emphasize that regardless of what medium I'm working in, my emphasis is always, the way I talk and everything is always going to be about color and design. Because when I get stuck in a painting, as I recently told uh, our, our members on a, one of our live Zoom and paint calls, is that when we're stuck, it means there's a war going on in your painting. And what I mean by that is that we've got seven design elements, and, um, and then there are a lot of contrasts, right, between warm and cool for color and highly saturated and desaturated. Uh, light and dark for value, textured and not textured. So when, when you have two things that are like equal, um, it tends to be uh, not easy to look at. And that's what I, I, I talk about as a war. So anyways, my painting, um, when I was done with the acrylic portion, felt like, um, you know, I again, I said I thought it was good, but I, I felt like I could do better. And at that point, I decided to transition to oil and cold wax. So the first hour, what we're going to do is... Um, I'm going to show you all the stuff that I did after episode three, okay? And then um, after that, and you guys, I want you to ask tons of questions if you have any, right? Because that's why it's live. And that's why I hope that you guys are enjoying the live sessions here. Uh, then in the second portion here during the second hour, I'm going to show you everything I did to move the acrylic painting into oil and cold wax. And there were quite a few steps, um, but, you know, it's not complicated, uh, I will say though that like the um, the method that I use when I move into oil and cold wax often will use a mask and it's just made of newsprint, very inexpensive newsprint. But um, anyway, so let's, uh, does anyone have any questions before we get started with any of the previous episodes? Because they do kind of build on one another. And we oh, yeah. have Rachmi saying, yeah, she's saying, I'm finding that higher quality handmade oils change measurable uh daily while they are drying oh interesting wow very different from store-bought i never would have guessed that around me that's pretty interesting hi kathleen and uh renee from alameda california great to have you guys so um if there are no questions to get started with again i want to um lisa and i will be watching chat and if you guys have a question um i'm going to show you my process and uh let me just start with this so uh, i'm gonna add this to the stream and then I have to move it to the beginning. Um, okay. So that's spotlighted, right, Lisa? Yep. Okay. So here I am just, I'm just talking about um, where I'm starting. Let's like open the volume just at the very beginning. And this is the painting that I was working on, but we kind of just ran out of time and I'm showing how I would progress through this painting. And so I'm just going to continue painting and recording. So here's uh, the painting and how far I got. This is acrylic. I'd say that I'm an explorer for those who know my three stages of painting, play, explore, and clarify, because I'm thinking now, but not thinking too much. I would say that I am exploring. And what I'm exploring is how to move this painting forward in a way that I like it better. It says more about me as a person and as an artist. Okay, so um, the more times you go over a semi-transparent color, um, the more it will become the opacity that you want. I do spend a lot of time mixing colors. And now I've mixed up this gray, which could feel kind of good because there, there is a plenty of color in here. Even in Explore, I'm thinking, you know, I have a lot of shapes right now and it's a little bit confusing. So by making uh, the painting so that there are fewer shapes, then I can sort of more easily move forward because I've made decisions to get rid of some shapes. Now, I really love, there's a light blue color here, and I'm going to give it a rectilinear edge so that we move toward a little bit more toward geometry and structure. It's all part of um, the things that I care about is to play chaos off structure and then i also love um, a sense of geometry so so i'm just showing you guys that i have a lot of colors here this is not a limited palette 
adding every color that I saw in that original slop board painting. And I'm time lapsing the video um, where I can kind of talk my way through it. It's kind of a combination of me talking live. Versus I kind of like the idea of a color change. Um, now this vibrant pink, I'm gonna put that in there and just see how it feels. It's gonna to be too bright, but that's okay. For right now, I just wanna put in a color that covers my slot board colors. And I'm not going to get rid of all of my slot board colors. I just want to be selective and All right, I'm just pausing this for a second um, because I want to explain that, uh, you know, what I'm doing in this video or what I'm doing in this painting with acrylic is I'm I'm looking for a way for me to uh, make some areas more quiet, more solid, right? Because there's a lot of these papers that I had collage on there had either design or they could have had a solid color, they could have had a pattern. And I, I felt the need to quiet down some areas. So that's actually what I'm doing right now. So these scored lines are proving to be very useful because they give me a kind of a place where I can stop the paint. So I just will use my painter's edge here to get more of a rectilinear edge. And clean off the painter's edge right away. <clears throat> and if you forget or paint gets dry, you can always use a little bit of alcohol on it to really clean it up. So there's a pretty big jump in color from here to here. Um, but in value, if, if I were to convert that into black and white, I'd say they'd be pretty close. And I, that reminds me that I should probably take a photo. Hey, um, so there's a question from uh, Jay Leslie. Uh, the question, let me just see if I can spotlight this. Yeah, there it is. Can you guys see that okay or not? Uh, um, I'll just read it to you. It says, I have a problem that I would like you to address. That is, how do you stop collage parts uh, to stop lifting? And I guess that comes down to adhesion, right, Lisa? Because you do a lot of collage as well. No, I don't do too much. I don't like sticky fingers. But yeah, <laughs> definitely, <laughs> definitely comes down to adhesion. <laughs> okay. Adhesion, yeah, is really important. And so, like, if you notice a little edge popping up, it's, it's good to address it when you see it happening. And it usually has to do with matching the right kind of adhesive to the, the thickness of your paper. So things like cardstock or heavier definitely need a gel, uh, gel medium. Whereas if it's uh, like thin paper, printer paper, or thinner like rice paper, I would say that a gloss medium uh, should work for you pretty well. Okay. And I'm gonna, because I can show you what this looks like in black and white. So a very gradual process and I'm not trying to paint around all these shapes. So I think that's important to point out is that it's not just a question of painting around something because that gets to be like, you start to, it becomes really predictable. And now instead of trying to paint around this circle, I'm gonna just pretend it's not there. Because it is collage paper, there's a certain relief to it so that when I sand, it will reappear. If I won't have the same color and you know little pattern that's on it, but I will have the shape. Okay, so I'm gonna just move this forward. You guys can watch um, as I do this because uh, what I'm doing is exactly what I said. I'm trying to simplify this painting and I'm just gonna move it forward a uh, little bit by little bit. Um, I, you know, if you have questions, uh, that's great. Go ahead and ask. Now, this one section though, I do wanna explain that if you guys are working with collage paper, and let's say that you like that weathered textured look, 
it's really important to sand that back uh, first before you lock it in with any gloss medium or matte medium, because as soon as you put gloss or matte medium on there, um, it kind of seals that surface. And if and I learned this the hard way. I found out that if I uh, go back in and I, um, let me just do this real quick. If I uh, sand first and then um, lock it in, that's great. I get that weathered look of the, the papers that I've used. However, if I, if I uh, put the gloss medium on freshly collage paper, let that dry and then try to sand that back, what happens is <laughs> it's very disappointing. The entire top just rips off. So you know how paper has layers, uh, especially like scrapbook papers or many kinds of papers have layers. And if you um, don't distress it first with sandpaper and then you put the gloss medium over the top, you let it dry and then you sand it. <laughs> when you sand it, um, all of the beautiful design and colors just get rips off the top and now you've got a white thing there because that's the layer underneath the color. So that's kind of what I'm showing you guys in, um, in this video right here where I'm putting uh, this gloss medium on each little um, thing that I've sanded back and, and I'm just gonna explain it in the video here. I'm gonna add this gloss medium uh, over the tops of these areas that I sanded because I wanna keep that nature of how they are sanded. And the best way to do that is sand them first, get that quality you want and then lock it in. Once you're happy with how you've weathered that surface, Go ahead and lock it in. So um, I'm just going to go over these areas. So notice I did distress the paper first because if you uh, put gloss medium or acrylic over um, a shape like this, that's scrap of paper, whatever, um, and you try to sand it later, then you won't get the same effect when you sand it. It will actually rip off the whole surface of your shape, your collage shape. So if it's a special paper and you're trying to, you, you uh, want to distress it, you want it to keep that same distressed feel. Distress it first and then lock it in. So time lapsing the video so you don't have to watch me do all this. Notice how glossy it gets. That's what acrylic does often, unless you're using a matte medium. And I'm lazy, so I am impatient, so I like to use my hair Acrylic dry. paint does dry a little bit darker, so notice that I'm putting the very same color on this, but. Um, it looks lighter until it dries, and then it will match. Something to keep in mind when you do a value scale in acrylic paint, knowing that it will dry a little bit darker. Part of the fun for me is not really um, knowing where this painting is going to go. I don't have any uh, preconceived idea. I mean, I can see where it is now, but I like it when a painting ends up being something that you didn't expect. So I'm going to use my, my ruler here and get a pencil. Increasing the sense of geometry here with some hard rectilinear edges. Because the sense of geometry is so important to me, So these are just some shapes that I have um, that I've cut out at various times. This one looks like a turnip. <laughs> and, you know, that could appear in the painting as well because it is related to a circle. It's just a different shape. And then this was cut out with a hole punch out of um, cardstock, which is kind of cool. You can see that. And these are stencils that I made, like a teardrop. I like to use that a lot. And even as I hold it over the top of the painting, kind of see how that looks. Um, here's just a, 
part of a letter, could have been like a letter P or a letter D or whatever. But this can appear, um, this is where you start to vary. Like I started with a bunch of circles. Um, that would never be quite enough for me anyways, right? Because it's, it's kind of boring. So, but if I lay this shape over the top, this is related to a circle. It's, it's just that it turns into, you know, this got rectilinear edges and that kind of thing. So if I lay this over the top, um, that could be an interesting layer there. And as far as that red goes, maybe what I want to do is um, have something like, it'll be off-centered like this. It could go off or it could um, kind of float like this. So maybe I'll do that just for the heck of it. Just this edge here. Okay, so as I'm doing this, um, I just want to kind of add that uh, shape is a, you know, one of our seven design elements. It's, it's really, really critical that you guys, uh, if you want your work to be super personal to you, um, shape being one of our seven design elements is crucial. Um, shape and value, color, texture, line, you know, all those things. These are um, the visual language of art and it's, it's um, the alphabet that we have to write our story. Um, what is our story? Our story is based on our lives. And that's what makes us unique. That's what makes our work personal. And, uh, you know, I have to say that uh, from, from the artists that I work with, and right now we're going through the Art Success Master's course, we really, really focus on, um, you know, diving deeply into who you are as a person. Because if we don't spend the time doing that, we don't really know what makes us stand out from other people. And it's not really, it's really not just technique. Um, the content of like what I'm doing right now and my, my sense of geometry, like why do I love geometry? It's because I spent a lot of my life studying it for one thing. And I, I guess my left brain um, has this part that likes to be challenged um, in math and, and stuff like that. I mean, uh, so we're all different. Not, not everybody likes that. So what makes you truly unique? And that's something that we do an awful lot. We spend a lot of time um, that's the real soul searching at the heart of your art. Um, and, and, you know, I've been painting a really long time and it took me like my paintings that I did 30 years ago look nothing like this. <laughs> There's been a huge uh, long journey. How about you, Lisa? Has your art changed a lot? Absolutely. Yes, so much. Even in just the last year, I would say. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, uh, yeah we've seen that. And so... As I show you what I'm doing here, um, notice that I started with a lot of curvilinear organic shapes. I then started to simplify uh, some of that kind of noisiness down because I like chaos, but I like to balance it with some structure. And that's kind of what I've done here. Um, and I, including scoring these lines into the wooden panel with an awl, an awl is kind of like a sharp object that is like a nail, actually, very sharp and pointy. Um, so when I added that structure, that provided some lines that I could start to uh, find those solid shapes in a pleasing way. And like I mentioned, there is no limited palette here. And so I'm just using colors that were in that original slot board. So the slot board actually became my inspiration for this painting. Um, so anyways, yeah, I just wanted to, to mention that um, uh, things like, you know, for me personally, geometry means a lot to me. Circles mean a lot to me. Typography and dots mean a lot to me. And, and those are all the things that you're seeing in here. And when I showed you those stencil shapes that I cut out, those were shapes that I love. And, you know, whether you cut out a stencil or not, um, I would say that, like, if you guys have a sketchbook um, and you use it to, to document those types of things that you see on a daily basis that catch your eye, like, Maybe it's repetition of a pattern you saw somewhere, or maybe you look around your house and you see that you've collected a lot of dolls and those dolls come from a certain country and that country has a certain pattern on all the clothing that the dolls have that you collected that for a reason. And those are the clues of your life. And I really, truly believe that um, to become the best artist we can be, we're kind of mining our lives. It's kind of like a big um, amount of, um, you know, when you when you pan for gold, you're panning from tons of little pebbles and stones that are in the water and you're looking for those golden nuggets. 
Well, those golden nuggets are your life. And all you have to do is identify those golden nuggets and then make your art about those golden nuggets. And your art will never look like anybody else's. It'll be so personal that that's what, when people uh, are looking to buy art, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for the artist who's taken the gold from their life and incorporated it into their art. And I can't tell you like how many times I've seen, um, you know, there, there's a lot of great art out there, but um, I think that it's, it is harder to mine your life for the gold. Um, it's hard to sometimes look back into our past, to look at our present and um, be able to, uh, like a funnel, put everything into that funnel and use what comes out the bottom, whether it's good, bad, or ugly, because good, bad, or ugly is actually what, what makes art great. You know, uh, many of the masters had uh, a lot of challenges in their lives, but they used it for good. So I just wanted to, to add that. Now I'm sanding and I'm using the 20, 220 grit paper. And this is all being time-lapsed. Um, normally I would do this outside, uh, I would have a mask on if I'm inside, but because I was doing a demo, I did not have a mask on. But then again, I'm, I'm holding the uh, sanding block parallel to the surface so that uh, it's um, not flying everywhere. But then I'm also kind of careful to brush those crumbs into the garbage. I just want to always tell you to be very careful about uh, safety when it comes to sanding because all that cadmium color and titanium white, um, those are the pigments that you want to be careful about. Thank you, Shiloh. <laughs> yeah, I kind of thought of that this morning. It's funny how things pop into my head. Now you can see the difference between matte and gloss, right? Um, super, super shiny, super, super matte. Now the super, super shininess of an acrylic is not something that I'm, I'm terribly fond of. And so I do have a system for treating a final acrylic painting. So it kind of looks like an encaustic. Um, not real fond of that super shininess. Now, it, it, you know, it's fine for some people. Some people love the, the shininess of resin paintings, but again, that would be too shiny for me. So now I'm just kind of like making progress on this painting, feeling better about it. It's got a lot of things that I like. So I guess I'm probably talking about the painting now. So you never had, or, you know, that I want in the end. So what I'm going to do is I'm first going to coat this entire thing with either gloss medium or it could be matte medium it doesn't really matter what but the, the point is to seal in the entire uh surface here again it doesn't really matter i think i'll use the gloss because matte medium does have a little bit of a cloudiness to it hardly noticeable but so i'm going to just put this on top and spread it around all right now when, you, when your painting gets to a stage that you like, it's always good to, I mean, I think it's good to lock things in. When I say lock things in, what I mean is um, uh, gloss medium or matte medium. Um, here I'm using gloss medium, um, and I just explained why. Uh, if you use a matte medium, um, there's just a almost imperceptible cloudiness in there. Uh, and you're not going to really notice that unless you do multiple, multiple <laughs> like layers of matte medium. So what I've done here is I've just um, used the gloss medium. And what's going to happen is when this dries, uh, all those matte areas are now going to be super shiny again, right? But you can sand that back and get rid of some of that gloss. Uh, any questions so far? Does this all look really super familiar to you guys? Uh, for those of you who are acrylic artists, is this like your method? Some of it is for me, except I don't use collage, but yeah, I definitely simplify and, and, um, cool. I let it talk to me. Yes. That's awesome. Lisa. Yeah. Okay, so I can probably fast forward this a little bit. Pretty soon I'm going to transition to oil and cold wax, and I'm going to just explain why I do that. So um, let's see if I hold it up here. I'm going to be the tans, uh, you know, reds. So I'd say there are a lot of warms and not as many cool. So that kind of helps me know what direction I would like to push this painting. And 
So warmth and, and coolness of a painting are a contrast, and it's great to have both, uh, but you want one to be a winner. So you don't want to have a war going on. I talk a lot about this. Um, when you're stuck in a painting, it's usually because there's a war going on between some of your design elements, one or more of them. Okay, so I'm going to use this um, golden nickel azel quinacridone gold. So there you can kind of see the, the label is quite messed up uh, because I use this a lot. And what I'm going to do, instead of mixing on my palette, I kind of want to dilute it a little bit. So I've got this airbrush medium here another uh, container that's um, quite messed up, but you can hear how liquid this is. So I'm not just gonna add water, I'm actually gonna put some of this on my painting. And now where I scored those lines and any place that I've abraded the surface, uh, any place there's kind of a little edge, that's where the glaze is gonna collect. Cause I'm gonna actually remove a lot of this. So what I'm gonna do first is just mix it with my gloved hand. So I've already diluted it with that airbrush medium. And I'm gonna kind of just move it around. You can move it around with a paper towel or whatever you want, but uh, the main thing is to, to kind of cover the entire surface with this one glaze. Now edges where I have sanded, uh, they are going to you know, probably pick up a bit more of this color unless I locked it in with that gloss medium which was the last step I did. So notice how it's, <laughs> when you put on a glaze, what happens is the darks get lighter and the lights get darker because you're just adding this color to it. And so I'm kind of just observing at first. Uh, but I also know that I'm gonna remove most of this glaze. So I'm just moving it around with my hand here. And now I'm gonna grab a paper towel. I'm actually gonna just dampen it a little bit with some water because now I wanna remove much of this glaze. I wanna show you what it looks like first. It looks like a bit of a disaster, but the main thing is that the glaze gives the painting harmony. So now I'm gonna just rub it back. And now I've got an umbrella of color, this nickel azel quinacridone gold, and it's really um, harmonized the painting. But it's also done a few other things. It's made my lights a little darker and my darks a little lighter. And so whenever that happens, you don't have to panic. That's completely normal and expected part of, um, you know, uh, being successful with the glaze is to, to know what to expect. Now I can continue to take a little bit more off. I can also repeat the glazing process if that wasn't enough. Um, so I just took off a little bit more but there are several areas where it has sunk in, like into the crevices a little bit more, where I had those diagonal lines, you can kind of see. And um, I might have to put, you know, like another layer of this on there, but um, on the other hand, you know, the degree of harmony is um, kind of up to you how much you want on there. And I can also glaze over any areas that are really like feeling like, wow, they're really not harmonious. Like, let's say the blue is a problem. You can certainly spot glaze. You don't have to glaze over the entire thing. But now what I want to do is um, it's, it's really mid-tone with some dark here, here, and there. So I'm definitely looking at my values here. And I'm looking for like further ways. Do I, do I need to calm this down? Where do I need to calm it down? Uh, what, what, what do I need to do in order to calm it down? Uh, what are my areas of interest? And this being the original slot board here has a lot of interest and it's close to a high contrast area. So one thing to make this a little bit more high contrast is to add some white to that little piece of scrap of paper that had a letter on it. And I love typography, I love letters. So that for me would be like a kind of a no brainer. Let's do that. You just wanna to start to do uh, things that speak to you. Like what's the first thing you can do um, to move your painting forward? Like what's the most obvious thing you can do first? What's kind of the no brainer? And you just start with one thing at a time, um, rather than looking at it as, oh, I've got so many things I've got to do. You just don't know how even doing one thing is going to impact the rest of your painting. So right now I'm just taking some white paint and I'm going to amp up, meaning increase the value of this little letter here. 
I need to be kind of careful because I want it to read just like it did before as this letter. So I'm making this letter lighter in value, which just means I'm increasing contrast between the letter and its background. And that will definitely attract the eye more because the eye is always looking for areas of highest contrast. So, uh, yeah, I'm right now, you guys, I, I showed you the value pattern and I uh, do that a lot. Um, and I know a lot of you convert your work to black and white and maybe in chat, if that's a common thing that you do, you might want to pop that into chat and let us know if you do that as well. Let people know if that's helpful for you and why. Um, we tend to see the value of color before we see color itself. And so what I'm doing here is I am increasing contrast. Notice how that letter S now kind of jumps out at you. And we have to be kind of careful um, where, you know, because it's a tool. Uh, the, the tool of contrast is something you can pull out of your back pocket anytime. Um, but you need to use it, you know, kind of wisely. And um, you, you tend to want to place the areas of highest contrast where you want the eye to go. So it's a tool, right? And uh, we artists have these uh, toolboxes of our uh, favorite things that we do, but um, most often the most powerful things we can do have to do with um, understanding uh, whether it's high contrast, whether it's harmonized, unified, whether there's rhythm or repetition and variation. And um, these are all things that we talk about with um, you know, design and color. So just know that everything I'm doing, um, like what's guiding me is my understanding of color and design. And like two decades ago, I just couldn't have done this. I, I would, I had fear and I couldn't move forward. I'd be like, no, let's, I think I'll quit while I'm ahead because I might ruin it, you know? And that was just such a bummer. Like I, I didn't like that limitation. I felt limited. Um, whereas if you take that time to really establish your foundations, then you've built your house on concrete. And you're essentially going to be able to build any house on top of your concrete foundation that you want. You'll be able to explore any style that you want, and you'll still know that it's you. Because you'll know, you know, again, if you spend that time on you know, what makes you personally different from everybody else, uh, no matter what you're exploring, parts of you are going to, to show. And you're never going to worry about copying another artist because you can't. Um, I share my what I do because I know nobody can copy me. I can't copy me. Uh, and that, that's actually just fine. So uh, now uh, collage paper, um, it's never too late uh, on an acrylic painting to add more collage material. And in this case, I've got tracing paper where I've drawn a line with an acrylic, you know, pen type thing and it's dry. I'm being very specific here and you don't have to be this way, but again, uh, you got a choice, right? Like you can just plaster that collage paper down and there it is. Or in this case, I'm uh, going to a lot of trouble actually to find like what size circle should I uh, make it as far as like the, the outline of it. And then do I want a diagonal on the, like a hard edge there? Yes. So I'm using my ruler and then I'm going to cut it out. You know, I'm going to a lot of trouble to fit this piece into the painting and that's a choice. So um, I look at painting, uh, and you guys, I'm sure, do too as well, but it, it's just a ton of choices, kind of like when you're driving a car. I just remember some statistic. When you're driving a car at any one moment, you are making, like, so many decisions at any one time. So painting is very much like that, constantly making decisions. Um, do I go warm or cool? Um, do I put in some, you know, geometry? Do I, do I want chaos versus calm? And I guess that's what makes art so challenging. And I'd love to know what make what you guys feel is like really challenging you in your art. Like what's the biggest challenge that you love? Like, is there a challenge you really love because it's, um, it's fun, it's hard work, but you always feel good when you've met that challenge. I think for all of us, we have something, right? How about you, Lisa? What's challenging for you? I think you're muted. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I had to unmute there. I don't want background noise. Um, getting quiet so that I can yeah. hear, you know, so that I can do it. Sometimes I have so much chaos going on, you know, so getting quiet just to be able to paint and to hear what needs to come out of me, just to let it happen. 
Nice. Yeah. Yeah. And do you feel like sometimes you want more chaos in some paintings and sometimes you want more calm? Yeah. Yeah. I usually start with chaos. So um, it's a matter of calming it down usually and just uh, I have to let it sit. You know, I'm, I'm always have to let it sit and talk to me and so that I am sure to get enough calmness down. So yeah. Yeah, that's cool. All right, guys, I'm going to talk about now, like, um, I'm at the point now with this painting where I could be done. And I actually popped this into a frame. And then I realized that I could go further. So let me see if I can capture this here. And that was after episode three, I kind of continued on. And but the more I thought about it, I thought, you know, it's okay. It's even, you know, just good. But oftentimes, uh, that's what happens when you give yourself or your painting time to settle in with you. I mean, it was still kind of new to me when I created it, right? And it was still kind of just a, um, I needed time to think about, can I, should I push this more? I mean, from a design standpoint, I'll show you the black and white, here it is. And uh, it, it could be done, right? Because for me, the value pattern is strong, but I don't have like at this point, um, a feeling of like, it is me. It's my personal voice and all that, but can I do better? And then do I feel an emotion coming from this? And while I love a lot of things that are in here, like, you know, dots and some geometry and pattern and, you know, all those things are in here, some text, it has all the things I love. So why is it that I don't feel more strongly about this painting and just say it's done? And again, I think that paintings can be done at many stages of their life. But the harder thing to do is to really um, give your painting time and do some major soul searching, right? Like, I think each of us knows inside of us whether we can actually push something further. And although that may seem risky, like, why not quit, to, quit while I'm ahead? Why should I push this painting forward? Uh, what if I ruin it, right? Uh, but the more you understand color and design, you're, you're just not going to have that worry ever. Like, I don't have that worry because I know that um, there is no risk. There's no risk um, of me not being able to finish this painting. The only uh, risk is that I don't push it far enough because that's where the growth comes from. If you want growth, then number one, it, it really does, uh, it's to your advantage to have a strong foundation in color and design because that's what gives you the confidence to push a painting further than where you might normally stop. And I caught myself. I was like ready to just, I had this in a frame and I thought, oh, well, it, it's okay. It's good. And I hate to say it, but it would probably sell. But that's not enough. Like, you know, the longer you paint, the, the more you realize that it's not just about being okay with something or being good with it or even selling it. Um, no, um, art asks you to do more. Your art asks you to do more. And so I decided that I would push this painting forward. It's a Saturday and I, I will see you on Monday. Uh, I'm going to work on this and I am going to move this into cold wax and oil simply because of all the times that I've done that, there's a certain quality that I'm after that I, I have not been able to really obtain with just acrylic. It's not that I don't love my just acrylic paintings, but I found that when I uh, start with something like this, which, you know, let's face it, it'd be hard to do this particular design in just cold wax and oil. It would have taken me a long, long time to say, come up with this dotted pattern and, and this kind of text and this little letter S here. And even like this, right? These are things that the medium does not readily allow you to do. So what if you like this, but you want to go further? So that's one reason why in my own process over many, many years, lots and lots of painting that I've realized that what the acrylic process allows you to do, especially if you're a cold wax and oil artist, is just get some paint down and start to move yourself toward what you love. But the final touches, if you then transition into oil and cold wax, you get a certain surface quality and you add value to your painting as well. Again, as much as I don't like to talk about what collectors are looking for, um, a painting that you can say, you know, is, is, is oils, right? Has a higher perceived value. And I only share this with you because if you are a professional artist and if you do show in galleries 
from my experience, that is just, it's just a fact, right? Acrylics are um, certainly sellable. People commission you to do it, but for those artists who go the step further and convert it into an oil and coal wax painting, there is a higher perceived value. And the reason for that is that oils are more expensive and there are some technical things you need to know to work in this medium. Now that that's not to say that, uh, um, I don't feel very strongly about just hundred percent acrylic work. Cause I do, I am telling you what, um, my experience from collectors has been and galleries and just looking at prices of other people's work. I feel like it, it it's important for us to know, uh, what we're dealing with here for those of you who want to make a living safe from your art. And uh, as my work sells and I see, you know, like, well, what are, what are people interested in? It's not that that's really going to affect me because I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. But I do in the back of my mind, realize that a painting that's started with acrylic and then covered with oil and cold wax is valued higher. And my prices are higher, but beyond that, like way more important than that is that the reason why I started doing that was because I liked the result better. So that's the most important reason for doing it. Um, and so I'm going to take this painting and I'm going to keep going with it. The value pattern um, is what it is right now. It's predominantly mid-tone. I'd say it has uh, secondary darks. Like this is a very dark area. This guy is dark. There's some dark up here, but the light, this is high key and it's a, um, a white and this appears also pretty white. So there's only very little, uh, lights in this painting, but I'm, I'm just going to totally change the value pattern because I want more from this painting. So that's the first thing I realized it's not, it's, it's good. It's not great. I want this to be a great painting and great for me does not mean it's going to be great for you. It means it's going to be great for me. And only I can answer that question. I could ask you guys what you think of it. And 10% of you might say, great, love it. 10% might say, gosh, I hate it. My three-year-old could do it. The majority of you might say, I don't care. <laughs> Ultimately, my personal voice does not, is not dependent on what the public thinks. And that's where I love every artist to get to. Like, you know, you need to kind of shut out the world, social media, um, all these likes that we get, like they don't really amount to a hill of beans because we personally know deep down inside how we really feel and that the role that social media plays is trying to uh, give you either comfort when it's good, when it's good feedback, sure, we feel good, right? When it's bad feedback, some of us feel really badly. That is sad. And it's sad because you as an artist have such a gift to be you. And when you get negative feedback or negative comments, it doesn't mean your work is really bad. It just means that people disagree with you. And that, if anything, if you really have put your heart and soul into it and you have strong design, which, you know, again, I think that's what gives you this coat of armor. Uh, who doesn't want that? So that negative commentary can bounce off of you like water off a duck's back. But that took me a long time to get to that point. But now that I'm at that point, I really do feel rather bulletproof. And that's something I talk about in my Art and Success Master's course. Ideally, we as artists, and it's not a question of how long it takes to get there, because most of this is mid-tone. It does make sense for me to lighten the value, to make some portions of this very colorful painting um, stand out right? That's, that's why you change value and value is how light or dark something is. So I'm going to just start off by making a gray. Oops. Not sure what happened there guys. Oh, I guess, um, yeah, I'll just talk my way through the, the, <clears throat> this is the final portion here that I do before transitioning into oil and cold wax. And what I decided to do was, like I said, I'm dramatically changing the value pattern now. I'm getting ready to transition to oil and coal wax. Uh, I could have done what I'm doing right now with oil and coal wax, but given that that medium takes a little longer to dry and I am an impatient artist, uh, I, you know, I'm going to use the medium to my advantage and acrylic will dry faster. So uh, that's one reason why I feel like the marriage between using acrylic on the bottom and, and going into oil and cold wax for me personally, right? That's not going to work for everybody, but I just want it to be like really, really fun because I, 
Uh, the fun thing about acrylic is that it is faster drying. You can, you know, manipulate the surface really, really quickly. There's not a lot of waiting. And then you come in with the oil and cold wax, which for me, uh, I use it kind of thinly. Um, and I'm using it to get nuances and subtleties that, uh, and, and differences in opacity versus transparency that are actually quite tough to do with acrylic. So I'm trying to exploit each medium to its advantage. And uh, this is a personal choice, but this is where I am now. And I'm going to, you know, let's, if you have questions, great. But uh, I then like recorded what I did after this and I, I moved it in totally into oil and coal wax. And so um, this is where I'm ending the acrylic portion. Does anyone have any questions um, so far? You know, that was a lot. Um, Lisa, do you have any questions or? <laughs> um, I just noticed uh, Kelly was appreciative of what you said about the paint and uh, that she said that she had been using art and craft paint and wasn't getting very good coverage. And um, do you use art and craft paint like for the first layer sometimes? Is that pretty much the best place to put that if you want to use it? So by arts and crafts paint, Kelly, are you talking about like, say, maybe the, the artist paint that's not professional grade? Is that right? Okay. That's that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Sure. You know, like artists use house paint. Um, Jackson Pollock used enamel house paint. Of course, it's falling off his canvas. So <laughs> there's that. But uh, I would just say that uh, the, the, the place for uh, lower cost materials that, you know, maybe aren't as um, uh, high grade would be in those lower layers. Like, why not? Um, because the, the main difference between student versus um, artist grade materials, meaning professional grade, is um, a lower pigment load for the most part. Right, Lisa? Yes, definitely. Okay, so that so if, as long as you know that, like, um, why not? Uh, if you're interested in history and layers and you just know that, like I just created a slap board the other day and it is like, it is, it is really ugly. Um, but I don't care. It doesn't really matter what goes in those base layers because it's part of history. And yes. uh, right. Yeah, that's right. History's great. And uh, people, the viewer, everybody wants to see usually that history. Sometimes, yeah. yeah, you have something that's so dynamic that happens in the first layer or two. And yeah, you know, you shouldn't touch it. But otherwise, history is one of the best things that people love to see. Yeah, yeah. Each layer gives you another opportunity to, you know, express something different about yourself. And um, so then we've got Renee asking, um, would you then call it a mixed media painting? Uh, let's see, I think I might have missed the first part of her question. Hmm. Um, let's see. Oh, thank you, um, IT Con B. <laughs> it looks better now that you edited it. Thank you. Um, Bonnie, love the dramatic risk you took to change the direction of the painting. Thank you. Um, Pam and Lisa couldn't uh, make it 3 p.m. Uh, watching now. Happy to be here. Great. Jennifer, great to see you. Um, Darius Judd, awesome. You're here. Yay. <laughs> and here's and a Yes, Arachami just had a wonderful comment. Okay, she says, yeah, I agree, Pam. I do not care what people think. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, even curators speak from their experience. So true. They are just people. No one can walk in your shoes. Picasso never cared. He knew himself. Strength. Wow. We should frame that one and put it on the wall. I love it. <laughs> yes, that's great. Thanks Bonnie's asking, okay, and what exactly is a slap board? I'm going to show you because I'm so proud of my slap board. It is so ugly. Let me go grab it. <laughs> yes. Um, oh, it's, so this is major ugly, guys. And this is very much like all of my slap boards. But look, it could not be more ugly than this. <laughs> Ooh, I love it, though. Here, let me make you bigger. Yeah. The cool thing, guys, like when I say ugly, though, um, I think the cool thing about the word ugly, like my what what I think is ugly, like Lisa just said she liked it, right? And yeah. I'm saying, <laughs> I'm saying it's ugly. So you could say to Lisa, why do you not think it's ugly, right? She'll have her, like, Lisa, why do you like this? Because I love the uh, shapes that don't have all the definite hard line edges, you know, I don't like, what is it? The outline, um, what is the name? You know, I like organic. That's it. 
Yes, you don't like geometry. <laughs> no, that's right. I like organic shapes and those lines. Oh my goodness. I love those lines and those bright colors that kind of clash against each other. Oh, that's just my favorite thing. Can I buy that, Pam? <laughs> you can have it. Come on over. <laughs> hey, I'm going to be there Saturday. <laughs> oh my gosh. That just makes me laugh that she would want this thing. So, yeah. so you just heard Lisa why she loves it. Now I'll tell you why I think it's ugly. Okay, because um, number one, I mean, if you saw, and I did, I actually recorded how I put the paint on this surface, and you would have laughed. I, I scooped up the leftover paint on my palette, and I, I slapped it on here, and then I rubbed it around, and I was in kind of a hurry, you know, which I usually am. Uh, then I just took my silicone tool, and I made some marks, and, you know, I just, I, this is leftover paint, and I wasn't, um, I was playing, okay? Now, but... Here's the thing, like, uh, if I were to work on this again, if Lisa lets me work on this some more, <laughs> we'll oh, see. I don't know. I like it. <laughs> Look, oh, everybody, everybody in the chat likes it, too. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, you guys are too funny. Wow. So, am I just wasting my time working on these paintings? <laughs> <laughs> no, because that's amazing too. Okay, well, <laughs> yeah, right. that one is the one you just held up is more you, and your slot board is more me, and that's okay. why it's a slot board for you. Yeah, because I mean, we're uh, so different, right? And yeah. yes. you know it. It, uh, it it's okay. The slot board. Well, I love it. I mean, because it's more me. But but for sure. you to send that out, you would never send out that slot board because it's not you. Yeah. Exactly. That's a good point. Um, yeah. So really, I mean, I think the main thing is uh, I'm going to clean my camera because Jennifer's saying I might have a bit of fog on my camera. So here goes. Yeah, hopefully it'll get better. Oh, hey, I think it well, maybe, maybe you got know, better. Given that my computer is um, <laughs> in the middle of everything. Is it <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry, not. Yeah, I do feel like it is a little fuzzy. Like Lisa's so clear, but she may have better lighting. Okay, guys. So um, any other questions about the process here? Let me get rid of that. Uh, I just showed you my process for the um, acrylic mixed media. Now I'm going to transition to the oil. Like what do you have to do to your painting to transition it over? And uh, I do this qu quite a lot. And I, um, to be honest, after I did this painting, which these smaller paintings, which I would say, you know, this is just like 12 by 12 here. Um, and I, I had this gallery come this morning and, and they want it. So it's going to go to them um, as soon as it dries. It's not dry yet. And it's also not even done yet. So I, I have to do a few more tweaks to it. But um, the point is that um, these smaller paintings, there's, you know, less time and less materials and you can go a little faster. And each one's kind of this little prototype. And once I came upon... Um, the fact that I loved the process that led to this painting where it is right now. I could say I loved uh, the beginning with acrylic and collage. I mean, it was so freeing, like you can't do anything wrong. And then I love the fact that I could then um, insert my love of geometry, which um, I always must have. And then, you know, just my feeling for quirky shapes and complex colors. This painting gave me all those opportunities. So that's my MO. As long as I can do that, it doesn't really matter what medium it is, I'm going to do it. Um, I hear some blurry um, sound. I hear some a uh, bit of noise. Lisa. Ooh, let me mute myself, see if it goes away. Yeah, it's gone. So I guess, well, what we'll do, Lisa, is um, when, when, we, when you talk, you can unmute or whatever, but I think I definitely hear some noise here. Okay, guys, so now um, at the top of the hour, I'm going to transition this painting into oil and cold wax. So let me just um, feature that. And um, it's going to be like before. I'll be stopping this several times, but I want to kind of start at the beginning and explain because it's kind of important that, um, you know, for any artist who wants to try this, and I encourage you to do it, and you don't need a lot of oil paints. You don't need a lot of supplies at all. You'll see that I, um, I have a lot of colors, but I'm not using much of the paint. So let me just get started here. I'm going to turn the volume up and here we go. And I'm just going to apply it with a sponge brush. Before I do that, though, I kind of want to sand because. Hey, um, so I need to back this up. Sorry, it, it kind of went fast forward. And, and what I'm doing here is I'm adding Liquitex Clear 
gesso over the entire painting. So that's kind of important. So let me start this up. Now to take my clear gesso and I'm really going to put it over the whole thing. And it happens to be really gritty. So you're going to notice that like these areas that currently seem shiny, like down here and here, they're going to go dull because this is a matte finish. And I'm just going to apply it with a sponge brush. Before I do that, though, I kind of want to sand because that's part of the fun for me is sanding it, you know, and where these areas are glossy um, here and here and here, you'll see that go duller. Now, normally, again, I would wear a mask, but this is very light sanding and this is not a terribly abrasive um, grit. So I'm just going to begin to sand. Okay, so I do I do a lot of sanding. Quite a bit in. So again, if you are an oil and cold wax artist and you don't have this Liquitex clear gesso, like a lot of people don't have this or maybe they don't have access to it. Um, you can go from a sanded acrylic painting, which is what I've just done here, right? I've sanded it. And because now if you were to look at the surface uh, really closely, like under a microscope, um, there are like all kinds of like, it goes like this, right? It's, it's definitely been... Um, abraded and the oil and cold wax will want to stick to this way more than if it's super glossy. So that's one reason why I wanted to sand back the glossy areas so that like, you know, you could move into oil and cold wax after sanding, but I like to take that one extra step where I then cover it with the um, Liquitex clear gesso. And again, you don't have to do that, but I, I like to take that extra step and so what I'm going to do is just make sure I got all the crumbs off of this, first of all. I've now sanded it. I'm going to put this um, <clears throat> clear gesso, and you'll see how now this area and any other areas that look glossy, like, say, down here and the red down there, this whole thing, are going to go matte. And I'm just dipping my sponge brush into this water, getting most of it out, because I really don't want to dilute that gesso. Okay, so then... I want to kind of shake that up a little bit and add your clear gesso. Now, the thing is that at first it's going to look a little cloudy, but that's like any acrylic. Just put it on over the whole thing. and You can use a brush, but I like to use this sponge brush because it gets a really even and thin coat. You really want it to be as thin as possible. I mean, within reason, um, just don't need to put it on thick. Just make sure you get the whole thing. Get those edges and corners, and then you can let that dry or you can use a hair dryer. Okay, let's talk about what's happened here. I just put a layer of um, the Liquitex clear gesso over the surface. And as you can see, as I turn the board, you're not seeing that glossiness anymore, right? It's kind of just gone um, very matte. And that's due to that uh, Liquitex clear gesso. And that's and you can feel it with your hand. It, it kind of feels like um, a, sort of like sandpaper, but not, not too much. I mean, it depends on how thickly you put it on. But I put on a pretty thin layer um so now what's happened to this painting like between where we started this session and where it is now um you can see that uh there still is this uh reference to circles but the circles are now not perfect in any way they're misshapen and i've got lots of grays here and here and this band and then over here now this is up until this point all acrylic so like why would i transition into oil and cold wax medium which is what I'm going to do. Well, I feel that using the oil and cold wax medium over this acrylic is going to amp up the level of um, subtlety and sophistication, which is what I crave. Now I did sand this um, before I put on that Liquitex Clear Gesso. You can kind of see how distressed that surface is. And I did that before applying the Liquitex Clear Gesso because uh, in the end, that's that's kind of the, the way you'd want to do that is do it first. Because once you put the Liquitex gesso on here, you've just sealed everything in. Okay, so now I'll turn my camera down and I'll show you my next step. I'm going to transition into 
oil and cold wax. Sometimes I need a pair of pliers to open these. As you can see this is a very old tube of titanium white and I wanna get every last bit out of it. So I will use a pair of pliers to get that off. And I know I'm gonna use up the rest of this tube um, to get every last bit out of your tube. I find these uh, metal ringers to be the very best kind, like the plastic ones don't do a very good job, but what you do is you just clamp it, like take it like this and put it in between here. So any one of you who've used a similar thing for squeezing out toothpaste um, and you wanna really clamp it so that you get where the bulk of it is. And I'm just going to twist it and get as much out as I can and get most of it out like that. And then you can just like squeeze it with your hands and just get that last part out. And now I'm pretty sure I've done a good job. Um, sometimes you can take just the end of a brush and get that last bit out. And then feel pretty good about throwing that tube away. And I've got some black. I don't need much. And I haven't added cold wax medium with the, the one to three cold wax medium yet. I will do that. And if you need to review, episode one is where I show you how I mix my one to three so I don't keep repeating myself. But it's um, basically one part Galkid gel to three parts of cold wax medium. That's what I do. Now that's not everybody does that, but that's what I do for strength and flexibility for faster drying and a slight satiny finish. So I'm, I'm now combining these one to one with the paint. Uh, my other colors then, uh, I don't need to, you know, squirt them all out right away. But on the other hand, I want to get an interesting gray. So in order to do that, I kind of need colors from the palette that I did use to get the harmony in the gray. And just to make it an interesting gray. So there's some dianthus pink and some transparent earth yellow. You don't need much because, you know, this is like the, the final layer of my painting. And I'm not going to be putting this on super thick or anything like that. I might grab even a few more colors as we go. But for now, uh, I'm going to start out with some of the main colors in my palette. And here's a bit of Payne's Gray. I will be wearing gloves. Now, most of these are opaque, but the transparent earth yellow is uh, definitely transparent. Um, but then again, I can make any of these transparent as we go. My cadmium red medium. Even though there are a lot of colors on here, I don't have a lot of paint. I grabbed some Williamsburg cobalt turquoise blue. This would just be like an accent color, I think. And, you know, I don't even have to do it with paint. I could do it with cray paws. I could do it with uh, RF pigment stick. Um, but for now, I'm just putting it out there. And a bit of this ultramarine blue. So I've got several um, warms, the pink, yellow, and red, and I've got some cools, the blue, cobalt turquoise, and the paint's gray. And what I like to first do is just add my cold wax medium, and so I don't forget later. Now again, up to one to one, so um, you don't need much. This just ensures I don't forget to add it. So um, I just want to say that this is the same oil and cold wax that I mixed up a couple weeks ago. It's still perfectly good and fresh. Um, it's just in a sealed container and uh, showing that I clean my tools with just paper towels. Um, in most cases, uh, the you know if it's fresh oil, it comes right off your tools and um, it's pretty easy cleanup if you work in this medium. If there are any questions um, from anyone out there about what I'm doing or why, um, can pop it into chat. Uh, that little area where I've got multiple colors as I clean off my palette knife is going to become my Harmony Gray. Um, that's one reason why I put out so many colors because I wanted a representation of the colors in the painting as it was right now. So now you can see I'm mixing my Harmony Gray and uh, it's this lovely, lovely complex gray that you just couldn't get. I mean, you compare this gray to something you mix with black and white and there's just no comparison. Um, and I love these complex grays. Like I, I live for these complex grays. So that's actually what I'm going to be using in the painting. Um, my idea for adding cold wax and oil to the acrylic painting is not to, you know, 
drastically change it, it's to make subtle shifts in like certain areas of the painting um, to bring out the beautiful colors of the collage a little bit more. How do I do that? Um, because those colors are mid-tone, well, if I don't change the value of what's around those beautiful colors, they're not going to stand out as well. So I'm using value as a tool. I'm going to be increasing um, the value, meaning I'm going to go lighter around some of these shapes. And I do use a lot of newsprint. That's what I'm going to be doing right now is grabbing some just plain old newsprint. Um, I have, a, have it on rolls and um, I'm going to be making masks with it. So um, this is an important part. I just want to show you this. It is. So um, I want the whole thing to have just a slight glaze of transparent earth yellow. So just this most minimal amount here. And I can see it now. And this just is my beginning of transitioning from acrylic into the uh, cold wax and oil. So I'm applying a glaze and you can take a silicone tool and I've mixed it now pretty well. And you can see I'm just like, you know, quite liberally um, just putting it over the entire surface so that now the entire surface has a bit of that cold wax and oil in it. It's obviously not going to dry right away, but I'm just kind of prepping it for the next step. I want it to be really thin and the, the surface is, is quite able to um, take on this glaze because of the Liquitex Clear Gesso. So you're not going to see a lot of change yet. Um, I'm just kind of moving it around to cover every part of it. And then I'll take most of it off, either with a silicone tool or I can actually just do it with a paper towel. So now that I've spread that around, and you, I know, you, again, you can't see it very well, but that was kind of, that's fine. Some things you can see very well and some things are meant to be a lot thicker, but this is a transparent coat. So if there's any glossiness before, it's pretty much gone now. Oil and cold wax is a very matte medium. The addition of delicate gel to your cold wax will give you the potential for a slight satiny finish, but it will never be shiny like a traditional oil paint. Okay, so now we transition into officially, now there's no going back to acrylic at all. <laughs> this is a real commitment. Okay, I just want to like say that you actually can go in reverse, but you'd have to be super duper careful to remove all of the oil and cold wax you just put over your acrylic painting. And the best way to do that is just to apply Gamzol, probably best to do it while it's still wet. But even then, like, let's say you did that and you're like, oh shoot, I didn't want to, I don't like it. Um, you can try to scrape off as much as you can while it's still wet, hit it with some Gamzol, let it dry, and then do some light sanding and you're probably okay. But I don't, you know, like I have not done that. Personally, I would just say, if you don't like it, um, keep working with it until you do like it because they're, uh, it's very hard to go in reverse. If you transition from acrylic over to oil and cold wax, I just look at it as, you know what, that's a commitment. Don't just, it's off the table. Don't go backwards because it's going to be a lot more trouble. And Rebecca asks, are you using tissue paper to wipe off? Um, that was really just paper towel, Rebecca, but, um, you know, I, I think that that worked fine. And, you know, if you need a little bit of Gamzol to say, uh, wipe off some of that. And what I just did show you there was a glaze. Okay. So I was just like, that's the first thing I did transitioning over. Okay. So now what I like to do is um, just take a look at what I've got here and kind of look at the shapes I've got going. I'll scoop that over a little bit. Um, and take a pencil and kind of look at what I've got with the contour. Um, and I'm kind of looking at this edge here, right? But I don't have to do it exactly like that. Um, in fact, I don't, I don't want to do the exact same thing. I just want to get an idea for how I can come in with, it will be a slightly lighter color. Um, so now it's more a matter of like, 
Um, you want to add a bit of a rectal in your edge here. And this is kind of going blind because I don't really know how this is going to end up. <laughs> but that's kind of the fun of it for me. Um, I don't really worry about that too much, maybe like this. All right, so now I'm going to cut it out. So this is what I'm um, talking about when I talk about a mask. Um, it's just a sheet of newsprint, and I know you can't see it very well. So but when I cut it out, you'll see. I have to keep track whether I want this part of it or the part that um, I'm cutting away from this sheet of newsprint. Okay. So now it looks like if I lay this over um, the edge here, it's everything that is exposed here that's going to get this layer of um, glaze that I've been working on. And, you know, that's kind of cool because I, if I glaze, some of this dark will go lighter. And uh, it's a question of, like, where do I want to move this around? And so I'm going to kind of just play with that a little bit. Um, that's why it doesn't matter really too much how I cut it out because I can always piece things together and go like this even. I'll take this piece and make a kink at the top. Let's see here. All right, so I guess that's, that's probably going to work pretty well. And then I'm just going to take my silicone tool, grab some of that paint, and let's just see what happens. Okay, so I'm you can see I'm covering over the acrylic now, and um, but I put it on, but see, I can take most of that off. So that's where I'm talking about you really have this ability for transparency versus opacity. And then, of course, once the oil painting, uh, the oil portion dries, you can then sand that back. So the ability to get a complex surface, there's first whatever you put on with the oil and cold wax, that's whatever level of transparency you want. But then there's also the um, letting it dry. And then that, that may take a while, you know, weeks, maybe months, depending on how thickly you put it on. But then you can sand it back if you want it to be a little thinner. And you can see with this, uh, because that uh, Liquitex clear gesso is uh, there, it grabs the cold wax and oil. So that even if I want to scrape, you know, most of it back, the beauty is that um, the Liquitex gesso is grabbing onto it. So I don't necessarily have to even sand this back. Or if I do, it's because it's so thin, I'm not going to have to wait too long for this to dry because it's being put on so thinly. And that Liquitex clear gesso um, is absorbent and it's grabbing the cold wax and oil so it will dry I think even a little bit faster. Again you can control the opacity and transparency as you do this. That's something you just can't do with acrylic. I could never do this what I'm doing right now with acrylic. So this is where um, moving it, this painting into cold wax and oil is um, an advantage as I see it because it's going to give me an effect I couldn't get with only acrylic. So then I come back in and again I'm lifting a lot and I want it to be smooth so I might take a paper towel and even even this out a bit. The silicone tool does one thing you can see how you can even make like these little marks with your silicone tool if you want and then if you don't like it you just cover it up again. So this gives you like a lot of opportunity for mark making um, whether it's wet or dry. Okay, so now there's that. And before I lift the mask, I just want to just take a paper towel and see if I can even it out a little bit. It's pretty good, but um, I'm just curious, like, what can I do here? So now I'm increasing transparency because I'm actually kind of brushing away from the mask. And a, a residual layer is going to be there of the oil and cold wax. But the question is, like, how much do I want to leave behind? And how smooth do I want this to be? So I'm going more transparent with this paper towel. And I can always go over it again, even with the same mask. 
but for now I'm just trying to get a feel. Okay, so that is something I could never do with acrylic. <laughs> and um, I think I'm going to just lift this up and save the mask. And let's see how we're doing here. So right away you can see that um, uh, there is a new layer there that has been um, created with the oil and cold wax. Um, if I go like this, you can see it even better. But um, where it went over this dark shape, you can see where it's semi-transparent. And again, once that dries, you can make even more transparent just with sandpaper. But um, that's a start. So I'm kind of really liking that. And you can even use like the very same mask, um, the reverse of it. Okay, I'm going to just walk you through this. Um, <laughs> this became very complex for me. Like, I don't know. Um, I, I think when I try to do these types of masks that get really, um, let me just explain that some masking can be a pretty simple thing, you know, when you're working with oil and coal wax. But in this particular case, and I've done other paintings like this where I've done like multiple, multiple masks. Um, sometimes um, the difference between a positive shape and a negative shape um, it's kind of like a, a mental game. It's hard to keep track of which half that, and I, you'll just see like there, this whole thing has been time-lapsed because um, I was really struggling. I, I got up some tracing paper to try and um, think more about the shapes that I wanted. So I kind of needed to see what, what uh, not just do this blindly. So I trace again and again, and it's like, um, it took me a while to get what I wanted. So I just wanted to explain that this is a little bit more of an advanced technique in terms of masking because um, I'm not trying to trace around the shapes I already have. I'm actually trying to uh, kind of think about what I have, but then, you know, like the whole point of doing this is to add some sophistication, some thin layers that really are, you know, they could either be transparent or opaque. And that's another thing I'm going to discover, as you'll see, is that, you know, I just wiped away a lot of that paint in the first layer with a paper towel. But um, as I progress through here, uh, you can always make a change. You can go from transparent back to opaque. And yeah, so that's why I've kind of fast forward this because it took me a long time to wrap my head around what I was really trying to do. And um, I was surprised uh, and not surprised because I've done this before and for some reason, the positive and negative shapes, um, they kind of play tricks on you. <laughs> so it was a, it's a real challenge. I don't know. Lisa, have you ever done anything crazy like this? <laughs> no, she says. That's probably wise. No, not not to this extent, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it, it's one of those times when I felt like I kind of bit off more than I could do, but it was like I was do I was recording it, so I thought, okay, well, whatever, and uh, yeah, it was okay. <laughs> well, at least you were up for the challenge, right? You kept going, and I probably would have put it away and hidden it just because it would have been too much for me all at the all at once, you know. <laughs> yeah, my brain hurt after I did that. I, I literally just felt like, oh my gosh, like what did I bite off here? You know, I could have quit a long. <laughs> yeah <laughs> but to be honest with you now i want to start like uh what i'm excited about next is um i've got these panels they're not terribly large they're like 36 by 36 and um by the time you get here lisa they'll probably be on the wall um maybe i'll have like three of them or something and um yeah. I, I want to try something like this right i keep building on the series that i've started here with the um kind of starting out with circles but then you know the honest truth about what these shapes are is they're 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 misshapen and, and deformed. That's the only way I can really explain it, is that I feel like they're um, they're really contorted. <laughs> yes. So. Okay. But it's um, looking good. I mean, yeah. definitely looks like huge. So did they take it? 
the people? Uh, it was wet. I said oh. that, it, um, yeah, she really liked it. And she said it was playful and she liked the colors. And um, it was the only one that was not popped into a frame because the edges were still wet. But um, mm. I told her I could ship it to her. So, yeah. Yeah. It'll be great. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Okay, so Kathleen says, I love building up a board with acrylic layers, uh, but putting cold wax and oil on top is really a surreal experience. Yeah, I, I met Kathleen at a, a, a fun workshop in, uh, was that Oaxaca or was that San Miguel? I think it was San Miguel. Yeah, pretty sure. Kathleen, I have to correct me on that one because I get the two workshops confused. Um, but she, Kathleen is, um, yeah, we're talking about visiting each other's studios as well. And she does a lot of stuff with uh, street papers, which is really exciting. And I've been experimenting with um, some of the street papers she sent to me, which were such a gift. Really cool. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. Um, yeah, so, you know, what I'm doing here, guys, is I'm just uh, looking very carefully at the painting and saying, what do I really love about it? And, yeah, I had color everywhere. Do I really need it everywhere? And I'm deciding, no, I don't need it everywhere. Um, and then, you know, there, there's a million different ways that you could do this. But uh, and, and then in that way, I felt like, you know, can't really make a mistake. It's just uh, kind of go with the flow. So um, part of what makes this a little bit tricky is that sometimes I've got a mask on the left and the right hand side. And so what I'm doing is covering up the area that will not be covered. And then, um, and that's where I got kind of confused between positive shape and negative shape. As you can see, it's taking me a long time. I've got a stack of um, all these masks that I cut out, like many of which didn't work out. So yeah. But the whole process is really fun. I finally get it right here. So now I'm going to actually cover up uh, with the paint. A little bit more tweaking with the knife. And I mean, when this dries too, uh, one of the things you can do is, of course, it's always a good time for mark making. So. Um, when the oil paint sets up a little bit more, I think I'll be adding a little bit more oil paint to this. I mean, mark making to this with um, just various pencils. <laughs> yes, the method of the madness is right. And Rose Stead is here. Thank you, Rose. I, I Yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, oh, San Miguel. Thanks, Kathleen. <laughs> My brain is like, um, I, I just can't help. I, they're both fabulous uh, workshops that I taught. Um, one was in San Miguel de Allende and then it's up on a terrace and it's gorgeous weather. And the other one was in Oaxaca, Mexico. And that's, so I met Kathleen at the first one. Okay. So the only tricky thing here, um, for those of you who are working in oil and cold wax is, uh, especially when you've got a mask on the left and the right side, is you kind of have to hold them down and you want to take that silicone tool and work from the edge of the paper inward, because if you go the opposite way, you might be moving the paint underneath the mask. And while that is okay, you can still clean up those edges. Um, it's much easier to just go from the paper toward the center. And you can see that like the area I'm trying to cover here is very tight. It's not like a, a huge open expanse here. So um, got a little tricky. Let's see. I don't know if I'm actually talking through different this. way of obliterating in that as I obliterate, um, I'm kind of telling the paint where to go. That's what the mask is doing. Some opacity, like maybe I want this part to be more opaque, even though I don't even know where that's going to be. But I did like that line in there. I remember that. So I can easily peel that back. 
And again, you can adjust the opacity when you sand later. See, there's no way I could do this with acrylic. <laughs> it just wouldn't work. And uh, so then, you know, the paint is wet, but um, I can in the same way take my pencil and go over this line that was there. Again, it's blind, but I mean, I can feel it. It was gouged in. Um, I can do stuff like that. Lines. Okay, so I left it up. And there's that. And turn it around. And then I might want to just um, lift some of this. So if I take some newsprint and just like it's a little bit too opaque for me. So it's kind of like this newsprint. If I press on it, it's going to lift some of that paint because I like this quality a little better. Hmm, I think what I might do is take this and put it back here. I'm gonna just kind of wipe back some of this more, I think. Okay, so I'm just curious how many of you um, paint with oil and coal wax medium because maybe you're more into the acrylic and not into the oil and coal wax. If that's the case, I can just fast forward this and you guys can just ask questions or, um, you know, anything that you want. Um, I, I just really wanted to show you my process and you pretty much get an idea for, you know, what's involved and the main thing is that you want to have either sand your acrylic paper painting or you want to put this layer of Liquitex clear gesso before you transition so that you have a very good uh, bond between the two. Um, but either one of those methods, I guess, will work. And um, okay, Rebecca does both. And Dara says, I have a stack of cold wax paintings and I was stuck with how I could work over it. Okay, good. Yeah, the masking, um, I guess the masking for me is um, very much related to shape making because, uh, and, and when you tear or cut, you know, that's the thing with newsprint, right? You can tear it or you can cut it. You have two different kinds of edges. One is kind of this unpredictable torn edge and the other one is this very predictable cut edge. And that's another thing that I really love. Um, yeah, thank you, Kim. Awesome. I'm glad you are uh, enjoying this. Okay, yes. Um, another, let's see, IT Con B says, I painted oil and acrylic, but not cold wax. And that's, that's really great as well. Um, personally, I got so intimidated by the thought of uh, working with traditional oils, because traditional oils, you have to kind of worry about fat over lean. And when you add cold wax to your oils, you don't have to worry about that. And that's what attracted me to it. Um, okay, Bonnie says, cold wax medium is brand new and watching this um, is fascinating. And carving lines into the wet cold wax medium, can you carve lines into dry? Yes, you absolutely can. Um, you can do so many things once the cold wax medium layer dries. Um, another great thing about it, um, scoring lines into it, um, Mark making, I've done crepe pies over the top, I've done woodies over the top and ink tents. So there are a lot of great things that you can do. Great, awesome, Marla. I'm glad this is what you're looking for. <laughs> um, it, it, it definitely got a little bit more complex than I, I was intending, but sometimes that's what happens. Um, this, you know, I'm just sharing you guys with what uh, things that I, I really just have to get some work done now. I've got a couple shows coming up. Um, one in July and then one next year. And so I guess everything I'm showing you, I, I can't always guarantee you what I'm going to be showing you or doing, but um, hey, if you're interested, I just want to share you, you know, what I'm doing and uh, give you the chance to ask questions. Pam, everybody just appreciates, I know I do, um, how real you are and you are brave and you show us it's not always easy and you just have to keep going and figure it out and not be afraid to do so. Yeah, that's, that's for sure. Um, I guess, uh, 
I just, um, I just don't have any fear of failure. <laughs> That's why I'm, um, I'm always like really happy to share with you my failures because I feel like I learned so much from my failures that um, I'm not sad. I'm actually kind of happy, not happy a lot, you know, <laughs> I'm happy a little bit. But I, <laughs> I'm not jumping for joy, but I, I am somewhat happy when things don't work because I, it's like a new puzzle for me. Like what? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's it's irritating. But I realize that in order to for to not you know to fix that problem, I'm going to have to like you know pull something out of another place. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Awesome guys. Yeah, it's just good to know that not everything is easy for everybody. You know, even you who are so experienced, it, it helps us to know we can keep trying. Absolutely. No, I, I, um, I, I literally always put myself into the position of being a beginner um, at the beginning of every painting. It's like, okay, number one, I've never done this before, not this exact painting. And uh, yeah, I, I feel like a beginner every single time I come in my studio. <laughs> That's great. That really yeah. is. Marie has a question here. Okay. Did you Thank use you. cooking oil or Gamsol to clean up that little um, stripe shape? Good question. I actually used my Gamsol just on a Q-tip and that worked so well. Uh, and the reason I didn't use cooking oil is because cooking oil I use for cleaning my tools, um, but then I have to make sure I get all the cooking oil off before I go back into the cold wax and oil because uh, yeah, cooking oil is great for cleaning tools, but it's really not meant to be um, like even like, I don't know how much you could get away with uh, if it accidentally fell into your pile of, you know, um, coal wax, if that would be okay. I'm sure a little bit would be okay, but I do try to avoid that. <laughs> Great question, Marie. Yeah. Um, so the thin areas, um, Kathleen was saying she likes them. And, you know, I, one of the things about this medium that I really love, especially with these silicone tools is, you know, you put it on, you put it on super thick, but then you can actually peel the whole thing off so that you've got a very, very thin, thin layer. And it's so translucent. Like there's something about that translucency that doesn't have any brush, brush marks or tool marks. And that's the one thing that I have not been able to do in acrylic. I wish I could. Like I, I know I can put a glaze on there and rub it around and sand it back and all that. But I just can't get that same like quiet layer that I can get with oil and coal wax. So if any of you has a secret for how to do that with acrylic, <laughs> I would love to know. Yeah. Nice job, Rose. Okay. Now I guess I talk a little bit about what's going on here. I feel like I've made some substantial changes in this painting that, that I really like that I couldn't have done with just acrylic. And I do know that as this painting will set up, and actually at any time, I can add some marks to it, which I know I will do. Again, we just couldn't do this with acrylic. And you also couldn't do this with just <laughs> cold wax and oil, right? I mean, it's the combination of the two, which is what I really enjoy. Um, there are certain things you can do um, with that acrylic underpainting especially if you love shapes. The grades are all pretty close in value. There's a little bit of a difference in the hue, meaning the color. I think this needs to really set up before I can um, like do some of my final line work. There's a photo of the painting, but now I'm going to convert it into black and white. And now you can kind of see how uh, there is a definite dark area in the painting um, in the upper left-hand quadrant, but most of it um, right now is still mid-tone. There's not a whole lot of light, so I can kind of work within those areas and think about how I want to increase some of the darks, increase some of the saturation, and increase some of the lights. And so those are kind of the more of the finishing touches, but I just wanted to show you how you would work from um, an acrylic painting and move it into um, cold wax and oil. Okay, so we're back. <laughs> oh boy, guys. Um, <clears throat> yeah, each time I do these Mondays, it's like um, I get so carried away after the Mondays, 
my whole point of this, guys, was to get momentum. <laughs> and it's working. And so what happens is after I turn off all the cameras, I, I keep working. And um, because I'm still documenting, um, I kind of trying to share the process of a whole painting um, for some continuity instead of like, okay, here's starting this one and starting that one. And then you never see how I progress. I don't know if you guys like that format, but um, you can let me know. Do you want to see... Uh, me go from like beginning to an end of a painting or do you want me to see how I start tons of paintings I think that would be a lot more boring somehow um, thank you guys and so yeah I'll show you where the painting is now um, unfortunately the color um, I know that for some reason my screen is not that great uh, in terms of clarity uh, color everything's different digitally somehow right Lisa yes did you check that setting to see if it was on 1080 HD yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. um, and this is just my friend. This is my better computer. But when I say better, it's, it's actually the computer that I use more frequently. So um, maybe the camera needs a, a good scrubbing. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it needs a bath. I don't know. But uh, yeah, if you guys have any questions, uh, thank you, Bonnie. And uh, Thank you, Donna. Never tried oil and coal wax. I'm so intrigued. I do say that, you know, if you guys... Um, ever want to try oil and coal wax, um, keep it super simple. You just, uh, for, you know, just, just get a little bit of the cold wax medium and a couple colors. And, um, that's really all you need. You don't need fancy tools. Um, I would start out very, very conservatively until you decide you even like it, you know? Um, yeah. So, okay. Beginning to end. Thank you. And then thank you, Carmel. Um, Whole progression. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks, Rose. I'm glad, kind of glad, guys, because uh, like I said, um, I don't, I'm just, I feel like um, the most valuable thing to share in any of these lives is uh, what it's like to kind of get stuck, get unstuck, um, design, uh, design uh, decisions, like why, why would I do what I did? Uh, what I what I love about looking at other people's art is, um, you know, the decisions that they had to make. And uh, so I, uh, I appreciate you guys being here and I appreciate Lisa being here. Of course, she's not there anymore. She's probably getting a drink. <laughs> but um, Lisa's awesome, you guys. So thank her for sure for being here. And um, I'll let's see. Any other questions? Okay, so that one layer, um, something about the Valley Carmel, um, maybe you could write that again. Okay, great, Kathleen has momentum. Lisa, I just thanked you while you were gone. I figured you were getting a drink of water. <laughs> Sorry, Coco was barking. I had groceries delivered. I had to go get them so she wouldn't keep barking. And you know, it's hot out, so <laughs> sorry about that. Thank you. And Jennifer, thank you so much for that comment. Um, I'm going to have to um, highlight that one because I have to read that again. Everything you do is so inspiring. You're my fairy <laughs> godmother of art. I love it. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Uh, thank you. That's very sweet of you. Um, I really appreciate you guys. And uh, if you ever have suggestions, oh, I know, I was going to give a free giveaway. I almost forgot. Um, it's not even a big deal. But um, since you're all here, um, so I know that some of you already have my catalog, but I had a big um, solo exhibition and I had a catalog made. So I'm sorry if you already have this, uh, then you probably wouldn't want this. <laughs> but anyways, um, this is the catalog that I uh, had made and, you know, a lot of stuff goes into making a catalog. I had a um, professional photographer um, come take the photos and then I had an awesome guy that lives like just about 15 miles away who does these amazing uh, prints for like really famous artists. And he just agreed to do something with me uh, for my catalog. And so he's been, that's Michael Wilder. So he's awesome. But um, I thought I would just do a, um, like a giveaway for, for this uh, catalog and then just put in a show card, which is, um, this is the Moscow Contemporary. And again, I know a lot of you guys that are on this already have, <laughs> have my catalogs. So you probably don't want another one. And here's my little patch for artandsuccess.com. So anyways, what I thought I would do is um, give it to somebody who, um, like, I'll choose somebody who comments below this video, okay, so that I can look at the comments below. And um, if you already have a catalog, just say, already got it, you know, um, so that I don't 
pick you up. I'm just going to like choose somebody who made a comment below the video and then I'll just, I have to reach out to you and get your address so I can actually ship it to you, but happy to ship it anywhere around the world. It's not that expensive. Um, yeah. So any other questions? Oh, you've got your catalog. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> Kim does not have the catalog. Okay. Well, you better make a comment then below the video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've been, I've been trying to post your link, Pam. And for some reason, I don't know if it has been letting me. So oh. I apologize for that. I know um, people are probably interested in having that. I'm going to try to do it here under your name in the comments to see if it'll work. Um, for some reason, my phone isn't working as oh, far as right. posting. I know Marianne was having that trouble and now I'm having that trouble again. So anyway, oh. okay. So I, there, there, we went. I, yeah. yeah, it worked under your name. Don't know why it's not working under mine. So. <laughs> thank you, Jan. Yeah. Thank you, Jan. I'm really glad this is um, exactly what you needed. And um, it's a live chat, the comment. Um, no, because after this is over um, at this point, so this video will stay on the channel and you'll see the chat. But what I'm talking about is um, below the video on YouTube, under the live tab, you can put comments, 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 right? That happen after the video ends. So pretty soon this is going to end. And then after that, you guys can make comments, right? <laughs> yes. So you can also like, uh, you know, make requests for what you'd like to see. I've done a poll with the Cold Wax um, painting and um, painting sharing and tips, uh, Facebook uh, it's a private group. Um, you might want to look that up and join it. It's free. And uh, if you're like a cold wax enthusiast, definitely check that out. Uh, there's a lot of great artists in there. And uh, I did a poll. Is the poll still up there? Like, what would you like to see? I've had a lot of requests for large scale work. Um, so if I if I do that, there's a very good chance I'll start those out with acrylic. And um, just to like progress faster because I feel like I, I kind of need to pick up the pace in my studio as far as like um, creating the work. And um, again, that acrylic underpainting allows me to go uh, get paint on faster and uh, get a lot of things happening. <laughs> so what was the name of the free group, Pam? I want to put it in the comments. Sure. I got to, I got to make sure I'm going to give you the right thing here. So, I mean, cause there's a very specific name. Let me just find that tab real quick. Okay. It's a Facebook group. Um, Cold wax is the first part. Paintings with plural, cold wax paintings, sharing, and tips. And I'm going to post, I can also post the link right for you guys. Um, okay, yeah. Yeah, I grab the link here. So, guys, this is the link to um, cold wax paintings, sharing, and tips. And uh, yeah, and. Um, I like to pin a new painting at the top of the, like the cover photo. I choose somebody's art there and everybody's like sharing their work that they do in this medium. And um, I'm not too familiar with a lot of artists that work with acrylic um, as a base painting. So um, it's just something that, yeah, maybe it's just me who likes to do that. I don't know, but okay. Well, Lisa, I think we're good for today. Don't you? Yeah, it's been great. Okay, wait, here's a question, uh, a couple of questions. Uh, let's see here, Pam, let's just pin this so I can read it. i um, going blind here. Pens only, any advice before starting a huge piece for the first time? Yeah, um, I do think it can be a little tricky and a little bit intimidating. So when you're talking about the first time, I would first say, what is the largest size you've ever worked on so far? So let's say that you say it's 24 by 24. So pens only, can you tell me what is the largest size work you've ever worked on to date pop it in chat and i can um so that's what a good I, question pam because it does matter because it you know 24 by 24 could be the size she's talking about or 36 by 48 or bigger i so, agree yeah yeah, yeah. Definitely. so like let's say that the largest was 24 by 24 um i would like add maybe 10 inches to both dimensions and then go to say a 36 by 36 and then go to a 48 by 48 before you go for like, you know, six feet by eight feet, you can do that. But what you don't, what, like, I don't even realize sometimes how much number one paint I'm going to need, um, how much time it takes to cover that entire, whatever it is, um, how big your tools need to be. And, Oh, she uh, says, 
She's done 24 by 30 and she just bought a 30 by 40. Oh, that's actually, don't you think that's good, Lisa? Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect. I do think that's very, very wise because you're taking one dimension and just increasing the next dimension. So that should be very doable for you. And what medium are you working in? Pens only. I like your, your handle. Yeah. Yeah. That's fun. yeah awesome. Um, okay, great. So Marla does the acrylic first too. She loves the depth and the satin finish. Great. And then Susan says, um, I need to hear something. Pens only does acrylic. Okay, acrylic. All right. And Marie um, wants to see your final touches next time. <laughs> yeah, you know, my final touches I put most people to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they almost put me to sleep. So I'm like, wow, it's like watching an ant walk across the table, you know. Um, I oftentimes find that I don't um, capture that very well. And it, actually, this painting, I would say, is uh, mostly done um, simply because this morning when I came in, I did, I had my paint still wet and I uh, like this blue shape up, um, hang on, up here um, was really bugging me because it was like one, like one value and it had nothing else going on. And, and what I did was I, sorry, um, I added some cray paws and then I added a little bit of blue paint, um, added some scribbles. And so I've added a bit of pencil to this now. Um, so I think what I do with this one is going to be pretty minor. Um, but thanks for asking, Marie. <laughs> there won't be a lot to see, unfortunately. Yeah, pens only, you'll be fine. And if you work in acrylic, I would just say uh, you're going to need, you know, more paint. But um, whatever you did on a smaller scale that you really loved, you want to, like, write those, I'd say, write those things down that, number one, like, what part of the process do you absolutely love? Because no matter what size and no matter what medium you're working in, um, process is uh, way more important than the end result. Um, we oftentimes walk into our studio and say, I want, I want to have a great painting. I want whatever materials I have, however big it is, you know, of course, your ultimate goal is to, to finish it and Am I gone or is Pam gone? Can anybody hear us? Ah, okay. So am I here? Can you guys hear me? Pam is gone. Okay, so Pam will be back in just a second. I'm sure. I don't know what happened, but she'll be back. I'm sure she can tell that she left. Yeah. Here she comes. <laughs> we always love these technology glitches, don't we, Pam? We yeah. never know what's going to happen, do we? <laughs> I was so busy talking to myself, you guys, and I looked up and I was like, <laughs> Oh my gosh. Oh. What did I finish saying? Do you know what I'm talking about? I am okay. so sorry. Okay. But it's okay. What, what I'd like to just say before I get like uh, vanish off into the ether again. <laughs> uh oh. I don't know what's happening. You're gone, Pam. Or at least for me, you are. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if she can even comment below the video if she's gone because um, she has to go out and come back in. So, yeah, they got her. Yeah, that's right, Pins Only. They got her. <laughs> Isn't it just wonderful? Yeah, this is so good. So don't forget to comment after we're done below once we're done. And then she will... Uh, contact whoever for your info to give her a little giveaway. I have mine, so um, you're going to love it, whoever gets it. So be sure to do the commenting. 
and then we will be back next Monday at the regular time. Hi again. I was just telling everybody to be sure and comment below after we're done and that we'll be, be back next Monday at the regular time, which is. Yeah, um, it's it's um, 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, 10 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. And then so on and so forth. And you yes. guys, I always put that in the description below. Let me ask you guys, do you like this later time better or do you like the earlier time better? Because that was something I was going to ask you. Uh, if you guys, um, that's something you could comment below this video. It's like, what time do you prefer? Because there's nothing really special about the time we started doing these. And if I know this time is a little better for New Zealanders and Aussies, so... Um, we kind of just want to make it when it's the best time for everybody, like later. Okay, Laura Lee likes later. I like later. earlier. Do you like earlier? Okay, later is better. Jessica, <laughs> hi, Jessica. Um, Thank you for earlier. Like, I personally like later because my brain cells are working a little better by later, but um, <laughs> that's what she likes earlier. Earlier, earlier. Um, okay, yeah. well, continue to let us know, guys, in the um, <laughs> In the, in the comments below the video. It actually says comments. So there's a difference between comments and chat, okay? So I wanna thank you all for being here. It's been really fun. Thank you, Lisa, for being here. <laughs> You're welcome, thank you. All right, guys. Um, so thanks and we'll see you uh, again later next week, okay, for Momentum Mondays. Thanks right. everyone, great questions. Bye everyone. Bye.